Good morning, everyone. Great to see all of you. My name is Nick Elio, and I'm our Family Ministries Pastor. And thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, summer is moving right along, and we are excited to be in this summer teaching series uh, on the Lord's Prayer. And if you are uh, not familiar with summers at DCC, uh, Michael, our teaching pastor, takes a bit of a break. He continues to plan out our teaching calendar uh, through, uh, it'll be the end of 2024, we'll be done uh, by the end of this summer, which is great, which gives us time also this summer to welcome some guests and to have some friends come and teach. And so this morning, I'm excited to welcome our friend Jasper Peters. Jasper is a pastor at a UMC church called Belong and has been a friend of ours for some time. And their church is right here in the neighborhood, just five blocks down 16th. And so Jasper's been with us before. We're excited to have him teach this morning. If you would, join me in welcoming Pastor Jasper Peters. Blame me. It is me. I am the problem. <laughs> I'm so, so grateful to be with you this morning. Y'all are some of my favorite people and have been individually and collectively so encouraging to me and our ministry belongs. Sorry if I'm a little loud. Well, I don't want to. I get excited. I'm excitable. I've learned this about me. You'll learn it also. I don't want to hurt you in my excitement. That said, uh, as, as Nick shared, my name is Jasper. Uh, if you're talking about me, you can use words like he and him. And I'm the pastor at Belong Church just down the street. And we're so grateful to be uh, neighbors. There's a reality here, though, that if some of you are visiting churches, you may have visited my church and you may be visiting this church today. Doesn't need to be awkward. People do that. I'm not mad. <laughs> we're, we're neighbors. It's, it's okay. We're here this morning to talk about prayer, and we would be remiss if we just filled the, wor the, the space with words. Earlier, we were invited to be fully present in this space, and I think that taking a moment and a breath and a space for silence. If you know Howard Thurman, sometimes he would start a speech with silence, sometimes five, six, seven, eight minutes of it. Y'all might walk out or get real anxious if I were to do that. I'm not gonna do that to you, but I do wanna invite us to just take a moment to be here, because I want to ask you, do you know where you are? I think you probably do, but do you know that you were in the house of the Lord? When I was young, my mom had to point out to me in church, sometimes my ADHD would show up and I would be like humming or whistling in the back row, just in my own world, and she would say, Jasper, pay attention, you're in church. Now, I don't need you to pay attention, I don't need you to, to feel like you're in a classroom, but I do want you to pay attention to the fact that you have been invited into fellowship with God's people this morning, that you have been invited away from your normal routine and into a place where things are different and people are different and what we are after is a little bit different. So for a moment, can we appreciate the silence and appreciate who God has brought together this morning? Look around and see Christ's body. Exactly. This series is an exploration of the Lord's Prayer. If you're following along in scripture, you wanna to go to Matthew chapter six. We're gonna begin in verse five and go through 15. If you'd rather listen, that's okay as well. If you wanna keep that, that page open, we'll be in this, uh, in this space for, for most of this morning. I'm gonna be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Many of you have the NIV, which means you'll just have to be paying close attention. <laughs> If anyone can tell me whether this is also 60, uh, 65 words, then, then that'll be fascinating. It begins, and whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. 
When you're praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is the word of God for the people of God. We might say, thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, in these profound rich and challenging words of Jesus, allow us on this day to find life. Though we are separated by years and miles and even the limitations of our minds, God, we ask that your Holy Spirit be present in this place, inside us, between us, helping us to come to a better understanding of you and live in better peace with each other. May the words of my mouth and meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and redeemer. And together, God's people said, amen. There is uh, this ancient Christian saying, before our tradition was really written down, often we would just memorize things and say them again and again and again. There's uh, a spot in the beginning of Philippians chapter 2, beginning in uh, chapter 6, where Paul is, is offering this, this Christ hymn, it's called, this prayer in early Christian communities. It's this commendation, this way of saying, I am praying that you can be like Jesus in these ways, and I want you to pray that I can be like Jesus in these ways. And in some ways, uh, it begins with Paul saying, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. As we're beginning a teaching on prayer, I think more than anything, I would love for our minds to be in sync, not with each other or not for you to think what I'm thinking, but instead for us to be doing everything we can to diligently be thinking in the ways of Jesus as we try to understand this teaching on prayer. Prayer is a tricky thing. I have felt like I've been praying wrong more in my life than I felt like I've prayed right. I've watched other people. Thank you for the giggle of, of relatedness. The silence from others, I'll assume, I'll assume it's judgment or relation. Whatever it is, you can hold on to that. That's fine. Right? But, but for me, I would watch other people. I would watch my mom pray in the spirit, pray in tongues, pray in a language that I can't understand or translate. I'd watch her on the phone with her sisters, and I would think, I want that. Like, if we get to sign up for spiritual gifts, if there's a form somewhere, I want that box, because that seemed pretty cool. And also, like, if my prayer was going to be more powerful, more effective, better heard, better yet, I want that kind of prayer life. I want that kind of engagement. But that's not a gift that I have. And so I, some, I will watch others, my mother included, praying. And I've learned not to be jealous, but I've learned to say, oh, well, that's a kind of prayer, but that's not quite how I pray. In fact, I believe there are so many kinds of pray, praying and prayer. It's not that there's a right or wrong way. Once when I was uh, teaching a children's moment at church, I asked, how, how do you hold your hands when you pray? Now, it's dangerous to ask children questions, right? Because what I was assuming is I was going to get like the classic prayer hands and this little girl like leapt to her feet from, from the seat and she said, I go like this. <laughs> like, what are you praying about? What's the matter? I don't, but is that wrong? I didn't want to tell her that that was wrong necessarily, but our approach to praying can be varied, and I think that that's why this teaching shows up in the midst of what Jesus is saying. If we're looking at the whole teaching, it's worth knowing that Jesus is talking to a group. It's, it's his first major teaching. It's this establishing moment for him at the beginning of Matthew. And in fact, if you're looking for the edges of this teaching, it's a long teaching. Jesus goes from chapter 5 to chapter 8. He continues teaching and teaching and teaching and laying out a foundation for what would be the Christian life. It's worth noting that the first thing he did, he, the first thing he did after all of this teaching, he stood up, he walked down the mountain, and he healed someone. It's interesting for me to hold that as the thing that comes after. But right here in the middle, right in the middle of the teaching, is a teaching concerning prayer. I think Jesus understood that we are tempted to pray 
in the wrong ways. And it's not about like this, right? It's not about how we're holding our hands, but instead it's about how we position our heart. We sometimes are praying vending machine prayers. God, if I do this, will you give me this? If I do this thing to please you, will you offer me this other thing? And it, all, it leaves us with this question, who is prayer for? Is prayer for God? Is, is prayer just for me? Like, is it just uh, like, like walking and like <laughs> exercise? Like, it's really not good for anything except maybe my health. Is prayer for other people? Is prayer something that I'm doing really? I just need to be focused on other people. I want to spend some time thinking about this for a moment. Who is prayer for? Have you ever not prayed a prayer because you didn't want to bother God? Am I the only one who thinks? It's like, this, is this the level that I want to bring to Jesus? Mm, I'll just tweet it instead. Right, like this is... <laughs> I love it when I know that I'm a misfit, but I'm not alone, right? Like, I'm, uh, like there are things that I know are concerning me, that I know are weighing on me, but for some reason or another, I decide I don't know if I want to take this to God. Is this something that God's even going to care about? I don't want to bother God, but in reality, often I'm really hiding from God. There's stuff I don't want to say, because if I say it out loud, it's real, or if I form the words in my mind, it's real, or if I have to pray about it, it's really a problem versus something I hope will simply disappear and just stop being an issue for me. I might not pray because I don't want to bother God, or I might want to hide from God, or maybe I just don't know what to say. Hi, God, how was your day? Feels strange. Like, right? Like, what is it that we're saying that we're after when we are praying? And in reality, when it comes to God, I sincerely believe that God simply wants you to be present. God doesn't want to know that you have properly filtered your worries and only brought those that are sufficient. God is not bothered by you simply saying, God, I, I feel your presence in this moment and I want to be attentive to you. And I don't need anything and I don't need you to fix anything. I just want to be present with you. That is absolutely a valid prayer that you can pray and it doesn't have to be fancy. And as our scripture says, we don't have to pile on heaps of words and be like those hypocrites. You can simply say, God, I recognize that you are everywhere and you are in everything and you are in me. And right now I am with you. And that helps and that matters. Jewish philosophers believed that God already knows what you're going to pray about. God already knows what you're worried about. God already knows what the issue is. God just wants you to take the time to be present. God wants to be consulted. Maybe before Twitter even. Right? Like God, God simply wants us to be willing to be in conversation because so many times we're not or we tell ourselves these stories that our relationship with God isn't big enough for that problem or that God's grace isn't expansive enough for this kind of concern. We tell ourselves these little lies and these big lies over and over and over again and simply and in truth, God simply wants to be in relationship with you, in conversation with you. God made you on purpose so that there could be a relationship between you and the one who made you. It doesn't matter if your hands are wrong or, what, or your heart feels sideways. You can simply be present with God. We absolutely pray for God in the sense that we are praying so that we can be in relationship with God and that matters. And there's this thing, by the way, that happens when we're praying, when we're in that constant conversation with God. There's a, a, a philosopher named Friedrich Schleiermacher. It took me two weeks in grad school just to memorize how to spell his name, and it took the full 10 weeks of the course for me to understand what he was after when he would talk about Christ consciousness. And it took 10 full weeks of reading translated German theology to understand one of the most beautiful ideas that I've, that I've ever been presented with. And it's this, it's that Jesus in his life, in his ministry, as he's walking around, as he walks up a mountain in chapter five and sits down so that he can teach a great big group of people, Jesus was in prayer constantly. Jesus was in conversation with God constantly, so much so that he was always doing what God wanted him to do. He would say what God wanted him to say. He would pray in the way, he would heal in the way, he would move, he would walk. Every bit of how he moved through the world was in light of his relationship with God. This is what Schleiermacher calls Christ consciousness. And for me, I only have a handful of moments where I really feel like the presence of the Spirit, everything was working in the right way. Have you had those moments where you feel like, I know, for this 10 second period, for this 15 minutes, for this day that I'm here, I'm the right person in the right place at the right time. 
It's that. Imagine if your whole life was that. For Jesus, a life of prayer means a life of presence with God. It means a life where your whole mind is surrendered to God, where God's consciousness is your consciousness, where you are constantly saying, God, what would you have me do? How would you have me be? That sounds exhausting to me right now (laughs) because I'm not yet perfect, because I'm still working on this. I'm still learning to be like Jesus. But when I am at my best, I am asking God, what God thinks, and I'm telling God what I think, and I'm in constant relationship. So yes, there's a way in which prayer is for God, but it's also for us, because it helps us to be in relationship with God. It helps us to follow after Jesus in that way. The more that we pray, the more that we ask God what God thinks about the world around us, about us, about what we're up against, the more that we do that, the more that we engage in that practice, the more that we will be like Jesus, that we will have the mind of Christ surrendering to God, letting our actions be in line with what God would have us do and who God would have us be and say and know and feel, all of that. Suppose, though, suppose that, I'm, that I get better at that thing. Suppose that I get better at the surrender of the Christ consciousness, better than I am today. Let's say I'm great at it. Let's say I am walking through the world in perfect relationship with God. Do I need anyone else at that point? I mean, I love my kids. They can hang, right? You, y'all seem lovely. I'll come back next summer maybe, right? But, but like, do I need other people? If I'm doing the right thing, Is there something about this relationship with Jesus that requires me to be in relationship with other people? A few moments ago, we sat in silence, not with your eyes closed, not asking you to look down, but asking you to look around at other people. Uh, About five years ago, I had the opportunity to visit Palestine and Israel and be in some of the places where Jesus and his disciples were, and actually got to visit the, the place described in Matthew 5. In preparation for this message, I actually found my journal that I had with me in Israel, and I remember going to this mountain and thinking, that is not a mountain because I'm from here and I'm judgmental in that way, (laughs) but this beautiful sloping hill. Uh, (laughs) But the the important, I share that for a reason though. Jesus went up the hill because the crowd following him was so big. There was not a conference hall, there was not uh, an auditorium, an amphitheater that they could find. So instead, he found a place where naturally, the way that the landscape was, it would gather his voice and carry it to all of the people because there was one teacher and many people listening. Keep this thought. If you have a favorite podcast, let me ask this, do you, or radio show, do you ever sometimes feel like you're actually friends with the podcast host? I'm going to go too far. Do you sometimes talk back to them? This is called a parasocial relationship, right? These are not real relationships like you have with each other. This is a relationship that in your mind and your feelings, it feels real. It feels like a really substantive connection between you and that person, and yet they don't know you. (laughs) And if you are having a bad day, they are almost certainly not going to be the person that you call in that moment. I recognize in moments like this, I love making connection and looking at you, and I am trying to speak to you, and yet, I am one person and you are many. I'm imagining these people sitting on this sloping hill, straining and struggling to hear every word as it's amplified past the people in front of you, going to the people behind you, and these people are trying so hard to focus in on the words of Jesus, believing that he has a message for them. I'm wondering if they miss the fact that they were in a body of believers already. They were surrounded by other people in that moment. And in that moment, other people might have just been irritating, right? Other people is like, the guy's too tall and I can't see, and then the... the for me, I have to say, I, I, since I hear little voices from over here, I'm, 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 I don't at all mean to pick on you. It's my favorite thing. It's what lets me know that a church is alive when I hear kind of little voices around. Also, I know others might get distracted sometimes. Can you imagine how irritated people would have been if they couldn't hear Jesus because of a baby? (laughs) Or like the guy over there who keeps saying, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm trying to... Other people, there's a world in which other people might seem like the barrier between you and your relationship, your ideal relationship with Jesus. 
If it wasn't for these other people, I might be able to get closer. And, in, and, and for some of us, we frame our faith as a story starring me in which I am the hero, in which Jesus has come to rescue me and everything ought to work out for me because I'm the hero of this story and we forget. One of the most important things that I want to share with you is that when we are people of faith, it is not a, a single person sport. It is a team sport. It is a group endeavor. Even when we are praying, I want you to, we're going to look at this. We're going to look back at the words of this prayer. Even when we're praying, even if we think that we just have a direct connection between us and God, and that's the point, if we don't recognize the role that other people are playing in our life of faith and in our prayer life, then we are missing something crucially important. I want to look not just at God, not just at how our prayer life interacts with God, not just how our prayer life builds us up, but how our prayer life allows us to be in relationship with others in the way that God wants us to be. So uh, I want to, as we're looking at these words of Jesus, I love that when Jesus says, pray in this way, our Father, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us as we... Do you see what I'm saying? There's collective language and understanding here. It is not, God, I need my daily bread, and if you do that, then we're good. It's, God, we are a people who need to be fed. And if there is hunger among us, we are not whole. And if there is hunger among us and also plenty among us, then we are in broken relationship. Jesus, from the jump, is inviting us to recognize we're not just praying for us. We're not just praying so that we can be closer to God. We are in relationship right now with other people. There's a, another place in the gospel where Jesus says, if you are at the altar, you have prepared your sacrifice for God, you are at the altar, but you remember that there is brokenness between you and your sibling, you are to abandon your sacrifice at the altar and run to be reconciled with your sibling. In Romans 12, uh, 18, Paul says, uh, as much as, uh, as much as it is up to you, and as much as it is possible, live at peace with everyone. We are constantly being invited into reconciliation, but our temptation is to view this world as a story starring me about me, and all I want is what I need from God. All I want is for this vending machine to work the right way. If I put my part of the bargain, then God's going to be faithful and give me what I need. All the while, it's possible to forget that we were born into community, and we are constantly being invited to remember God cares about us. God's salvation is for us, not just for me. Our Father in heaven. This joke is so old, I'm offering it because it's not even a joke, even if it's a little funny. One of the most miraculous things I think that Jesus models for us is having friends in your 30s. with it, right? Sit, sit with it for a second. Jesus created and fostered vibrant community with people who are different from different places, with different ideals. Even their desires in the world might be in conflict. Jesus built and fostered vibrant, faithful community by asking people to pray for each other. At the end of this prayer, he talks about saying there is this reciprocity. There's this connection between the way that God deals with us and we deal with each other. God, forgive us our debts, and we will be that kind of people. Forgive us our trespasses, and we will be a forgiving kind of people. There's a connection between the way that we're in relationship with other people and the way that we understand our relationship with God. Um, we mentioned earlier, I'm from the United Methodist uh, Connection tradition. Uh, John Wesley is the, the person who started the Methodist Connection hundreds of years ago. There are so many people who are Wesleyan who, who, who've been influenced by his teaching and preaching, but he offered this idea. He, he was big on holiness. He was big on what is the way in which we become more holy, become more like God, and he offered, there is no holiness apart from social holiness. Here's the idea. You can't be so good 
that you will be and become closer to God while ignoring the people around you. There is no building up of you. There is no Christ consciousness building up in you. There is no perfection uh, on behalf of the Holy Spirit happening in your heart if you are structured to only focus in on yourself. If the story is just a story about you and God, you are missing more than half of the story. John Wesley says there is no holiness apart from social holiness. The idea being that we don't have Jesus to hug and hold and listen to in this moment in the same way that others did, but we do have the ability to see Christ in each other, to be Christ with and for each other. And in that way, we are being more like God. We are honoring God. We are worshiping God because we are serving the people who we have access to. I'll tell you a story. Uh, Two of my friends, they are still my friends. I love both of them, but it, it was remarkable the difference in reactions. I called my friends, two different, separated by 10 years, two different phone calls, but calls to my friends when I was in a really difficult place. One friend, I sat and I laid out, hey, you know, here's what's been going on, and I haven't been able to really text about this, and it's a lot, but here's where I am, and here's what's hard, and here's where there's room for others. You can't, like, underline things or italicize them in text, but I thought that that was, like, the emphasis, right? Here's, here's what... I need, and here's what I've been dealing with. And my friend responded, I'm so proud of you. You're so brave. That's not always a fun thing to hear, (laughs) by the way. (laughs) When you've been experiencing difficulty and someone says, I'm so proud of you, you've been so brave, you got this. Okay. Ten years before this, though, I shared with another friend on one of the worst nights of my life. I called and said, I'm having a really rough time, and my life seems to be falling apart, and I wonder if you could pray for me. And he said, yeah, what's your address? And I'm like, those are weird prayers. I've never... (laughs) And 30 minutes later, even though it was 11 p.m., he was on my doorstep, and he sat with me, and we talked, and we laughed, and we played Xbox, and he sat there while I cried, and it wasn't weird. And he was with me in that moment, and I realized, hours after he arrived, that this whole thing has been a prayer. (laughs) This whole experience, all of the moments that we have shared together, have been him working to be like Jesus with me because I needed someone to be with me who wanted to be like Jesus. And I appreciate my other friend who spoke words of encouragement and belief, and yet, if there's a way that Jesus is asking us to be, if there's an attitude that we are being asked to adopt, not just toward God, not just as we think about ourselves, but toward other people, The best example I've ever seen of that was my friend who, when I said, pray for me, he said, what is your address? And he was there with me. Prayer is being present. That's it. Prayer is being present to God, present to your relationship with God, present to what God might want from you, present to who God is building you up to be, present to the story God is telling in your life. Prayer is being present to God, and prayer is actually being present with yourself knowing what you need, knowing that you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to have everything put together, you don't have to be perfect in order to appeal to the God who decided that this universe wouldn't be right without you. We can be present, even in our hurt, even in our broken circumstance, even in our confusion, we can simply be present with God, and that's enough. But even as we're present to God, And even as we're really honest about being present in this space wrapped in flesh and iniquity, not yet perfect, even as we're doing those two things, we are missing the mark if we are only worried about ourselves. If we're only telling the story about our our own life. I want to share um, one more personal story, and then I want to take us for a quick second into chapter 8 where this teaching ends before we close. Um, during pandemic, I, like, I lived at home more vigorously than ever before, right? Like, I was, I was there. And so I'm working, and I'm looking out the window, and I notice I've got a neighbor who's wearing 
uh, a Batman shirt, like a, let me be clear, like a 1989 Jack Nicholson as Joker, Michael, Michael Keaton, like the yellow, like a Batman shirt. And so like, I saw him and he's like, he's running by and it was just a nice thing I noticed. And then the next day I noticed him running again. A couple days later I noticed here, here's Batman running again. So it became a fixture in my life, in my home. Here's Batman running. And uh, <laughs> Even recently, I mentioned to my son, I was like, dude, Batman's getting faster. Like, he's really getting after it. He's, I'm proud of my anonymous neighbor. <laughs> Went to the park the other day, and uh, another kid is playing with my kids, and I'm, you know, talking to whoever this stranger is, like a single-serving friend, someone you I don't think I'll ever see again, chatting with him. And we, we say hello, and then we're getting ready to depart. And my oldest son, who's an introvert, says, hey, do you live around here? This stranger, who I was fully prepared to let sink back into obscurity, right? Like, <laughs> um, and the guy said, yeah, yeah, I, I, I live right up here. I'm, I'm, I'm always running around. So I said one of the stranger things I've ever said to a, a strange man before. I said, are, are you Batman? And, <laughs> and the words came out before I could actually frame them. I said, are you the guy who wears a Batman shirt all the time when you're running around? He said, yeah. And I was like, man, you've been getting faster. Good job. You know, like I'm... I'm encouraging him, and he says, uh, he said, thank you. Actually, uh, about two years ago, I had a heart attack while I was running, and it was a really scary thing, and my life really had to change drastically, and so now I'm still running, but I can't go too fast, but I've, my doctor is working with me, but I'm grateful because I'm pursuing my health, and I stopped in that moment, and I said, I could have had this moment slip by and never made that connection, never known that, and I would have allowed that person to just be a fixture in the background of my life, and that's fine. There are people who live in that space, but now, that story, it woke me out of my sleep and it helped me to recognize that as much as I'm concerned about my story and what my kids are gonna do and how I'm gonna do things and everything I'm worried about, there are people around me living full lives, living sometimes difficult lives. Sometimes there's tragedy happening right in front of us and if we don't ask the questions, if we are not in relationship, if we have not asked God to tune our hearts so that we can be sensitive to the needs of the people around us, we're missing it, we're missing it. There's no amount of relationship with God that makes up for that. There's no amount of, of fully matured, present, I'm great that makes up for a lack of other people, other relationship, concern for others, praying for others. Are there people who you pray for? Are there friends who you pray for? Are there friends who pray for you? And if not, that's okay, but get you some. Go after that. Pray for that. Actively work on that as a part of your life of faith. Don't just dive into the scriptures and be building up your knowledge and wisdom without building up your relationship with the people around you. So as we, as we prepare to close, I, I want to jump ahead to chapter 8 for just a quick second. I know you all are going to spend a lot of time in this teaching this summer, and you'll have time uh, to continue to explore and view this teaching from many angles, and I'm grateful for that and grateful for you. In, Ma in Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, it says, When Jesus had come down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. There was a leper who came to him and knelt before... I'm going to pause. I'm, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about everything that we've just been talking about, a life of prayer put into action in relationship with other people, and simply hear the story of Jesus. He came down from the mountain. Great crowds followed him. There was a leper who came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you choose, you can make me clean. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I do choose. Be made clean. Immediately, his leprosy was cleansed. Then Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. I want you to think about this. Through all the teaching that Jesus offers about prayer and so many other aspects of our life of faith, the first thing he does is he walks down the mountain knowing that this whole crowd who's been listening attentively, struggling, straining to be with him, to hear him, to learn from him, this whole crowd walks down the gently sloping hill with him and he models, he puts into action the living of this faith. 
And the first thing that he does is he repairs a relationship, a social relationship that was broken. He didn't just heal the man, but even by extending his arm before he touched him and offered healing, Jesus showed by his extending of his hand that Jesus was willing to be in relationship with this man. Making it okay for others to then be in relationship or repair or rebuild relationship. Jesus brought healing not just to the body, but to the relationships. In that same moment he heals the body, he restores their, the possibility of a place in community. He also sends that person to be in right relationship with the priest. Go and offer yourself to the priest. Be in the rhythms of God. Not bragging. Not doing this so others will look at you and say, oh, here is someone to admire. Oh, here is someone who we ought to be like. But in humility, doing what Jesus asks. And the result is healing and right relationship. Jesus asks us to be in right rhythm and right relationship with God, seeking holiness not just for ourselves but for those around us. And then he shows us what it looks like in practice when there is healing and hope and restoration that comes from that. My prayer for you is simply this, that every day as you pray to God, that perhaps these words from the scripture help to frame your prayer. You might say, our Father who art in heaven, and that's wonderful. And you also might pray and say nothing. You might pray and say everything. But my prayer, my hope for you, for your community as we go forward, is that you are willing to commit yourself to prayer. Be present. Be present to God. Don't be afraid. Don't feel judged. Don't feel not enough. Don't feel cast out. Be present to the one who created you. Be present to who you are now and who you're becoming. And be present to those who God has put in your care, in your midst, with you in relationship. Let's pray. Gracious God, if we were to not say another word, it would be enough. Even in our silence, even in our not knowing, you are enough. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you for being in relationship with us, for talking to us, to, for listening to us, for allowing us to be in relationship with each other, to know more about you in light of who you are to other people. Continue to bless us, keep us, and tune our hearts to seek after you when things are easy, when they are difficult, and every moment in between. Let us see you and know that you are our God and that we are your people. In Christ's name, amen.